Oh, I want to talk to you about Darren Shan. Darren Shan, a lot of spelling mistakes for a big book. Is there a lot well. of spelling mistakes? There is I, quite a few I spelling to the mistakes. Audiobooks. Oh, okay. And they don't come out in the audiobook. He doesn't say literally what's on the page. <laughs> <laughs> no, he doesn't. He doesn't say. No. There, there are there a lot of spelling mistakes. Yeah, definitely in the first two, more so than Tongues of Blood. Ooh, but that's that's harsh. Yeah, I don't know how big the author Darren Chan knew that the book would get. Mm. I feel like he just banged it out. I really feel like he just. Well, like... actually, I've got some. I've got some information on oh, yeah. the creation of the book. Harry Potter. 100 million copies, 120 million copies sold, first book. Twilight, 100 million copies sold, first book. How many copies of Soaked to Freak, Darren Shan's first novel, do you think sold? Oh, I don't know. I'm judging by those two numbers you've just given me, yeah. I'm going to say 40 million. 25 million. Really? Yeah. That's, it's still, it's not small numbers. It's banging, I bet you get good money out of that. <laughs> yeah, he's probably doing all right. Yeah. Um, or didn't, and that's why he wrote a subsequent 11 more. <laughs> well, so uh, he spent 22 weeks on the New York Times bestseller, and he'd already written the first eight books before the first one got published. Oh. Uh, which is interesting, because in a interview, he likened to, he said his biggest influence is Stephen King. Okay. Which I find interesting, because all of his books are very short and concise, and that is the opposite of what a Stephen King book is. Yeah. But if you take the Darashan saga as two books or one book so they're about 100 pages each right yeah so 1200 pages so you got two game of thrones books basically yeah or one, like, or one copy of, Dragons. of the strand yeah and over that time does like i'm interested to see when we reread the later ones if that feels like a cohesive narrative compared to the first one the first few but we're gonna move on that's fine okay um, i'll talk about darren shan the bat so we were obviously huge fans of darren shan when we were a kid we've read two of his book series yeah demon Arta and uh demon Arta the and Vampire uh, the Darren Shan saga. Do you know that he wrote four grand series, including a series called Zombie? That was after Demon Arta, wasn't it? Which was after yeah. Demon Arta, and he's now written The Saga of Larton Crepsley. Yeah, it's a prequel, prequel. Right? Yeah, I heard that there was a prequel. I, I did some light Wikipedia in yeah. as well. Sounds as bad. That does sound like a shameless cash grab. <laughs> um, but I don't know if he's hard up for cash from the sounds of it. I feel like he just has a lot of fun writing yeah. this shit and then bangs it out because he finds it easy but profits massively from it. Oh, well, I don't know how much you get from, like, selling a bunch of books, right? Well, J.K. Rowling's r richer than the Queen, right? But, like, how much of that was from how much she got from her movie? What yeah, movie deal she made? True. And, like, the, the merchandise, like, is she George Lucas and she got a cut of the merch? Because <laughs> yeah. Primark shitting out fucking Harry Potter socks like it's going out of fashion, mate. There is a bit of uh, poetry between George Lucas and J.K. Rowling and that they became massive hacks who ruined their own work. So, the movie was actually four movies. So they, they planned four movies right. and had budget for four movies to condense the first three novels, sorry, the three, no three novel chunks, each trilogy, into story. However, the first movie was a massive flop. And we haven't seen it. No. But we will talk about it in the future. Yeah. But Shan had this to say about it. I liked it for what it was. Compared with other movies, it's an odd, quirky, left of field little film that I think I would have liked if I'd seen it purely as a viewer. Obviously, I would have preferred a more faithful version, but hey-ho. So I'd be interested. Very diplomatic. That's very diplomatic. I'd be interested to see the movie and see how fucking absolute, how much of an absolute lie that is. Have you seen the cast for it? I've seen the poster. I it's know it's got John C. Riley in it. <laughs> Willem Dafoe, I think Selma Hayek's in it. What? I think Selma Hayek's Trusca, the bearded lady. Interesting. Well, yeah. she just plays a, has a very small role. She appears twice in the first three books. Yeah, she comes into it more later on, so maybe they were like, lock her in for the franchise and we, yeah. we've got her in. Um, and in addition to that, uh, there was a manga spin off. <laughs> yeah. Which I tried to get. I tried to get. A, so I've read, I've read it. I tried to get a copy of it. I ordered it on, um, online, and, and they sent me this, which, can you describe to the audience <laughs> what that is? That is a standard issue um, paperback of Cirque du Freak. Yeah, cool. So it's the, it's the one we had growing up as well. You have yeah, this yeah, exact copy, one, right? Yeah. It's got the same creep spot on it. It looks spooky. It looks like something you shouldn't have Yeah, yeah, as a definitely. Kid. Yeah. Like it, I, I never really thought about this, but the cover definitely drew me in as a kid. Yeah, it has a really good, like look of like it doesn't look like anything of the time like if you think about that, what the harry potter books had on them yeah it's, you know, quite it's very similar to the twilight attempt of like you know that black background with like something symbolic on it and just the title yeah very cool so Cheap. i went to a different listing and bought manga 
Right. Would you like to see what I read? <laughs> is it another copy? Oh. What? Can you describe to the audience what this, this is? Uh, I'll need a minute. It is Larson Crepsley holding Madame Octa out tantalizingly. It's a bright red. It's but... bright red. There's lots of like, there's like ivory and bone decoration around the trim. Uh, what nice. colour is Larton Crepsley? He is blue. In the book. He's not blue. In the book. <laughs> I never explicitly said that Larton Crepsley wasn't blue in the book, so I'm fine with this interpretation. <laughs> yeah, it looks like um like goosebumps. Yeah. It's very overproduced. Yeah, and it's this is post Demonata. Yeah, so I feel like if this is what it. they looked like when we were growing up, I wouldn't I would have been less interested. Yeah, me too. Was there 12 or 13 books? I feel like there, was... there was 12 books. Right, okay. Which um, I can tell you why there's 12 books. Uh, because on the spine here, you can see there's a C of the more modern cover. And yeah. if you get them all together, it says Cirque de Freak, but duh takes up one book because that equals 12 letters. Oh, uh, okay. So that's how you remember how many books are in the Cirque oh, de Freak. Oh, is that my handy mnemonic device for remembering <laughs> the 12 books? I just count all the letters in Cirque de Freak yeah, except and do is minus one. one. <laughs> Yeah, I had all 12 books as a kid, um, but a friend of mine stole them. No, I lent them to him, mm. and then he sold them for cigarettes. Uh, was and, it a and, cigarette per book? Or what was the yeah, book I'd was like to trend? know the exchange rate on that. And, uh, and evaded <laughs> me when I, whenever I questioned him about it, but I'm not bitter about it, it's fine. Um, and just before we move on to actually talking about the contents of the Soap to Freak, uh, I don't know if you knew this about Dan Shan, but he actually writes adult books as well. No, I didn't know about Darren uh, So he's written... He's published something called The City Book Trilogy and The Lady of the Shades under the name Darren Shan. And then he's published five more adult books under the name Darren Dash. Yeah, I read that on uh, again on his Wikipedia. Shout out Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> Big I... up Wiki. <laughs> <laughs> I will not donate you one dollar. <laughs> Get fucked. Get fucked. Knowledge is free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Darren Dash. Interesting um, pseudonym. For someone who wants to write adult fiction. Yeah. You'd think it would be like Darren. Uh, it's Darren. Like Cher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the saga of Darren. Yeah. yeah. He's a fucking egomaniac, this guy, isn't he? I mean, the first point to which is that he names the character Darren Chan. Yeah. So before we start, I'd like to read you out a brief summary of, I've written of the book. Just right. so that everyone knows what we're talking about. Okay. Cool. Spider-loving Darren Shan is about to learn three things in this world are true. Death, taxes, and vampires. While being sick at football at school, Darren and his three friends, Steve, and two irrelevant Ron Weasleys, find out about a freak show. Darren and Steve score tickets and they go. It's a good show, but afterwards, Steve asks one of the performers, Mr. Krepsley, to turn him into a vampire. Mr. Krepsley rejects this as he has evil blood. Later, Darren steals Mr. Krepsley's performing spider for some reason. The spider bites Steve and... <laughs> The spider bites Steve, and to save him, Darren has to pay the ultimate price, fake his own death, and be turned into a half-vampire, living the rest of his life with the horrors of the undead. <laughs> well, I take a bit of umbrage for the fact that Alan Morris and uh, the other one are, are Ron Weasley's. Purely in that, I think Ron Weasley is a much better character than <laughs> Alan Morris. I, I originally wrote that as two Neville Longbottoms, but I, I hasn't changed it on this, right. which um, I, I make mean, another Neville Longbottom... Uh, reference later on. Doesn't Neville Longbottom like ultimately save everyone? Yeah, I'm not talking happens. about Harry Potter. Sorry, it's just a better book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better series. Uh, there, I've said it. We can stop now. So the author starts and says, "This is a this is a true story, but I've changed the names. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed all the names, which I want to get back into in book three because there's some very specific name based jokes yeah. that either the author has put in or." He's rewritten jokes that he did in his life. But anyway, um, the main character is Darren Shan, but it's a true story, but the author is Darren Shan. So the yes. author's called Darren Shan. He's saying it's a true story, but he's changed the names. But he is Darren Shan, and that doesn't resolve. No. Well, in, in terms of resolution for this book series, that's also a fucking mess. Yeah, yeah, so we'll, get to, we'll, get, we'll get to book 12. <laughs> we'll get to book 12. <laughs> this isn't going to work out well. But it's it's very weird to write yourself as a like 13-year-old boy in yeah. a story where you get turned into a vampire. It's weird to use your own name because also, the, you know, if he ever wants to, you know, have a love interest, we're going to get into this later, uh, with another 30-year-old girl, like writing a story where you, a character named you based on you is snogging 13-year-old girls... 
Yeah, I, Love I mean, there's no age from. you can say that it's like, like he says in the beginning, a whimsical retelling of moments in his life that he has nostalgia for. So in that terms, I don't necessarily disagree with the putting in of the kissing of 13-year-old girls, because that did happen to him mm. years ago, yeah. and at time of writing, he can just look fondly up, back on that. However, <laughs> I do take issue with naming yourself your protagonist after you when you're not a visual-based medium. So it's not like people see him in the street and he named that character because people will see him on the show and be like, oh shit, it's Darren Chan, and just like Will Smith in Fresh Prince. Yeah. It's books. People can't see you when they read your content. You're, you're always a barrier of you. Yeah, that that's a very good point. And like, I, I take on the of, oh, this is me reflecting on events of my life because I was assuming that him saying this is a true story is an accurate <laughs> statement. Well, this is another thing. The intros to the books massively downplay the imminent race war that happens right <laughs> now. Oh, I'm Darren Shan, and you would not believe what happens to me. Oh my god, shenanigans, hijinks, you name it. But never really the gravity that the imminent race war requires. There's a lot, there's a lot requires. that happens, yeah. A lot's this is on. why I was like, how much did he know when he wrote the first book? Yeah, so he has a really toxic relationship with his friend Steve. Uh, Steve's a real piece of shit. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've had friends like Steve. Okay. Have you had friends like Steve? Only when I was a young boy. Yeah, exactly. You've recognised that toxicity when you get older and you don't become friends with people yeah, like that Yeah, Steve, his friend Steve, like, shouts at his own, screams at his mum, like, treats her like a piece of shit. And she's, like, such a nice person. She's like, oh, Steve, would you like some toast? He's like, you're a cunt. And I think that's <laughs> their relationship. <laughs> Maybe she is a cunt. We just we see, see we, well we don't see it. We don't see the home life. We only get told that Steve's a piece of shit. Mr. Crepsley for some reason, has magical evil blood sensing abilities as well. Steve is a piece of shit because Crepsley confirms it. Yeah. So, yeah. Does he, do, does he like, kick a dog or anything? <laughs> does he do anything, like, proper evil? No, he's not the little kid from The Butterfly Effect. That I can really get on board with. My next note is just, Darren Shan makes himself sick at football. So Darren... <laughs> <laughs> In the book, everyone's like, oh, we need, we need, oh, what do they call him? He's got, like, a nickname that's, like, they call him, like, you know, Slickfoot Darren or something. Yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah. remember what it is. And they're like, oh, we're two goals down, and, you know, Darren always smashes out a hat-trick every football. It's like, why? This isn't important. No. At all. But then, how much of this is pandering to the 14-year-old boy audience base? You're like, when you read this as a 14-year-old boy, you're like, I like football, and I wish I was good at it. <laughs> or, or I like football and I'm sick of it, so I identify with Darren. Because however much you can write it off as pandering, he's placed himself in the book by virtue of being the same name as him. So anything yeah. that happens to him is kind of projection, isn't it? Yeah. He's saying, I wish I was sick of football. I wish I was a vampire. <laughs> I wish I could flit. I wish I could gas scout leaders. <laughs> um, so then we're introduced to fate. Yeah. As, and it seems like it's going to be a running uh, theme throughout the book when it happens, because Darren, they, they manage to get two tickets to the Sector Freak, and to decide who goes, they throw three of the tickets up, and Darren and the two Neville Longbottoms close their eyes and put their hands... The Neville like, Longbottoms don't, they scramble for it. They're they scramble for the tickets, searching. they have loads of fake tickets, and Darren closes his eyes, puts his hand out, and the, the right ticket yeah. lands on his hand. Uh, why then? The, so they go to the Freak Show... Um, uh, can I call it that? They it's go to the differently the... abled show. <laughs> <laughs> like, what you... They go to the circus. I mean, if they've named it the Cirque du Freak, it's a freak circus. They're late. And Mr. Tall, who is a character, a recurring character, shows up. He's the ring ringleader mm -hmm. of the circus. And he's like, oh, don't worry. I knew you guys were coming. Your, da your name's Darren Shan. Um, I'll take your tickets. You're two very brave boys. How does he know all of this stuff? Yeah, so he has some um, main line to fate as well and, and yeah, is it fate foresight. Is it? Because they... Krepsley doesn't know about them, but Krepsley and Mr. Tall have a psychic link. Yeah, yeah. So so Mr. Tall's in on it. He hasn't clued Krepsley in. No. <laughs> Hibernius Tall as well. Is there a wordplay at foot there? Because I was like, for, for ages trying to fit. Because it's a great name. Oh, is that it? Who are tall is it? Are very high. Is it? It's I... lazy enough to be down. <laughs> The circus starts and they bring out uh, Wolfman, who's an indentured slave that they just show. <laughs> they, people just touch him. They show. They they drug him up. He's like a drugged up tiger. Yeah, they Singapore. shave him and sell his fur to people. In the yeah. Olympics. Um, and 
at the beginning of the sh show, there's like a loud noise that happens off stage, and that wakes the Wolfman out of his stupor because they've done magical. They've magically sedated him. They haven't actually sedated him. So if there's a loud noise, he's no longer sedated. Yeah, it's like he's hypnotized. Yeah, and he bites immediately bites someone's hand off. Yeah, which isn't a part of the show. No, they play it out like it is. I think he's leaving his options open for it to work out either way. Well, it's clearly not. We know it's not from reading. You know it's not in the. You end, know it's you? not in the fiction of the book. Uh, Mister Mister Tool has magic. Attach hand back powder. He pours some powder on the stump and attaches the <laughs> yeah. hand. Oh, the, no, the little people come and sew the hand back on as well, right? Yeah, but she, he has the magic powder. Yeah, maybe that's like a cauterizing thing. Yeah, that magically heals her hand and her hand's fine. Yeah. So that takes a little bit of consequence uh, out of the yeah. fact they have a wolfman. But he's like, oh, th that wolfman could have bitten your head off if you weren't more careful. There's no magic powder for that. There's no magic powder for that, which. This sounds like one of the most irresponsible shows ever, right? Because, like, magicians and, like, stage performers that do really dangerous stuff, like Penn and Teller are a good example, where they do the things that look dangerous. They fire live guns on stage. They do all this stuff that looks dangerous. But if they ever think someone's at risk of being injured at their shows, they scrap the trick. They're like, if there's a 1% chance of injury, we're scrapping it. No matter how good the trick is, we have to scrap it. Mr. Tall Circus has a wolf man that could decapitate a person in a second. He's like, yeah, that's just part of the show. I mean, in terms of production scale, the Cirque du Freak and Penn and Teller, worlds apart. <laughs> and they're just trying to make a living, really, aren't they? Also, they're not beholden to, to real-world regulations and health and safety. But it's, it, it's irresponsible of Mr. Tall, right? Do you yeah, know? but is he, ever, is he ever trying to convince you that he's anything other than... A circus freak, a freak circus owner. Yeah, I guess not. He's unashamedly who he is. He's Mr. nice Tull. to his friends, but he couldn't really care about muggles. Well, they try, yeah, they try <laughs> and uh, justify having the Wolfman as a slave by showing you that he's ultra violent. Yeah, which, which is like, not the same. Like, which so is not, doesn't justify. It. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's the way they're like. No, it's fine because otherwise he'd be out killing. You're like, yeah, but that doesn't justify your behaviour, Mr. Mm. Tall. You're exploiting him. For profit. Yeah, they are. They are properly exploiting him. And um, I'd like to talk about the circus performance. Okay. I mean, why don't you list them for me? Hands, hands. What, what can he do? He can run faster than a person can run, but only on his hands. Yeah. Um, I'll fucking love to see that. <laughs> I'm in. I'll pay admission just for that. Uh, Truska, who can grow a beard and you can't cut it. With normal, yeah, non-magical items. The bearded lady. The bearded animal. lady. It's That's not just fine. she's a woman with a beard. She can, she can grow, a beard. grow a beard. And retract the hair. Retract. That's great. I'd see that. Yeah. Um, Ever the snake boy. Prominent character, so that's an easy one. He looks like a snake. Looks like a snake, but he also has some snake characteristics. He's cold-blooded, right? Although he's never basking. They, they mentioned he's cold-blooded in the third one when they're in a snowy place. Yeah. And I've got some problems with how that works. They just wrap him up, but he can't yeah. insulate himself. Yeah, so right, just they're wrapping him up and just make colder. Um, Raymond's two bellies. What can he do? He can eat glass and bite through lead and yep and uh, stuff. And then what's the next one? Uh, Gertha teeth. Gertha teeth. What can she do? She has indestructible <laughs> teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Something about Raymond's two bellies, right? Yeah. Is that in the second book, I think the little people bring him glass and yeah, stuff to like, eat. Oh, here's a snack. Like, it's like... his normal food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his power is that. They show him as a performer, they're like, look, he can eat anything, and they give him, like, tins and bits of glass yeah. and cans, and he, like, eats it all in a big feast. Um, and then, apparently, that's just what he eats normally. But it speaks to Mr. Tall's economising, doesn't it? It's like, oh, we don't need to feed Raymond's two bellies. <laughs> can, <laughs> Normal yeah, yeah. food, he can he eat can shit. Theoretically, get calories field. from anything. Yeah. I'm, that, again, makes sense. I'm uh, on board. Gertha Teeth, I found interesting. Well, first of all, Gertha Teeth makes a big deal of, like, oh, you can... Go at my teeth all you want, but yeah. like, I still have normal gums. So yes. When you're chiseling my gums, I thought about this, yeah. be careful. And then immediately afterwards, she gets out an angle grinder, and someone's angle grinding her teeth. Now, that seems really dangerous to have someone go out your mouth with an angle grinder if only your teeth are indestructible. Yeah, because you can put enough pressure on the teeth that the gums just release them. <laughs> the teeth are strong, but the gums will give. Yeah. Um, there's one form we haven't spoken about. Ribs, the ribs guy. Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot about that guy. What can he do? He can play his ribs like a xylophone. He can play his ribs like a xylophone. There's another character we've forgotten about. Go on. Mr. Krebsley. Oh, yeah. 
So what can he do? He uh, is just Madame Octa's assistant, isn't he, really? What's Madame Octa? She's a spider. Uh, uh, this fucking winds me up so much in the book. She's a, in inverted commas, poisonous spider. Mm -hmm. She's a venomous spider. Yeah, great. That comes up so much. Even in the hospital, later on, they're like, oh, the poison in Steve is killing him or whatever. It's like, you're a fucking medical professional. Like, I hold you to a higher standard than this <laughs> retard 14-year-old boy. And Mr. Krebs, who doesn't know anything about anything. Uh, anyway, Madame Octa is a, a exotic giant spider tarantula, but also has venom. Yeah. Um, and she can like paralyze and kill people with a single bite. But she's also um, sort of thick enough to be uh, hypnotized by a flute. Yeah, well, it seems that you can make some sort of mental connection with her, and music aids that. It's not clear that the flute is what's doing it. It's just like a conduit, a vehicle yeah, for your thought. Like you can control it with your mind if you concentrate enough. Maybe the, maybe the flute is just an analog for like yeah. concentration. But basically, Steve goes up after the circus and says, "Can you make me a vampire?" Mr. Krebs says, "No, you're you're evil. Leave." Yeah. Darren sees this exchange. Does Mr. Krebs say anything to Steve about the vampire generals? No. Is he just straight up with, "Right, let me test your blood." Yeah. Is that because Steve's blackmailing him? I feel like Mr. Kretzky would really take this I mean he gets blackmailed by Darren later and he's like yeah really and, and also later in the series a kid dies and he's like oh should we just feed him to the little people like he doesn't really seem to get like he could just kill that kid yeah like the vampire is the vampire rule doesn't seem to be not to kill humans under any circumstance if a human's like I'm a vampire hunter and you just killed them I feel like the vampires would be like yeah Fine. great yeah. yeah good work yeah, so the Vampire General doesn't really make an appearance when he's talking to Steve about and it. And Mr. Krebsley very specifically says that he hates children. Yeah. And that he doesn't want to be around children. And this is very important because later in the book he really changes his tune on that. Yeah. Uh, Flip-flops on that a bit. What's the problem with the whole thing being fate and destiny, isn't it? Is that things that your characters wouldn't do and events that are extremely unlikely are now justified by the fact that the whole thing was being diddled by Mr. Destiny. Mr. Destiny. Um, so, yeah... They leave, they go back to school. He was supposed to go back to Steve's house. Yeah. After. But he goes, he, he goes home, and that's why Steve is like, what the fuck, what's going on? Yeah. And then, yeah, and then that. Then he goes and steals Man of for no reason. There's absolutely, there's nothing. He likes spiders. Yeah. Steve catches Darren with the most classic bait and switch of all time. Because he knows that his real name is Ver Horsten, <laughs> and Darren Shad doesn't know that. So Steve goes up to Darren and says, I know you saw me speaking to Ver Horsten. And Darren's like, look, whatever's between Ver Horsten and you, that's between you two. And Steve's like, you don't even know that name. Yeah, Darren's a fucking idiot. Which is very important because later on uh, he does an uh, Ocean's Eleven style swindle on a Vampanese. <laughs> yeah, which uh, is very problematic. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues with that. Uh, with that. But um, it's really irresponsible that Darren then threw... So when the, when the spider bites Steve, Darren throws Madame Octa <laughs> out the window. Yeah. Which is very irresponsible. <laughs> well, again, that's fine. I believe that he would do that, at least. <laughs> he's a piece of shit. Yeah. He's a spoiled 14-year-old, isn't he? Like, I, yeah. find, it, I, I find it hard to criticise him massively. <laughs> because I remember being a 14-year-old boy. Yeah. And being stupid. Yeah, it's and Im fucking so emotional like, and impulsive. Yeah, but I'd never thrown a cage out of a window. <laughs> to combat this, the finale of the book, the arc. Well, it's already an arc. It's just the event that happens. The end of book one, basically. Is Darren Shan decides to become a vampire to save Steve because Mister Krebsy decides that he does actually like children and wants. Well, yeah, well, this Darren, is the problem. Darren Shan. He explicitly tells Steve that I can't turn you into a vampire because you have evil blood. Anyway, even if I could, the caveat to that is the vampire generals look down on people turning children into vampires, so I can't do that. Also, I hate children. Also, I hate children. After a day, he's like, oh, do you know what would be nice if someone made my breakfast for me every day? I'd like a slave. And so just basically blackmails Darren then into yeah. becoming a vampire. And again, the only justification for that is that there's Tiny... There's, has, some, has there's some sort him of to mystical will being yeah, posed Yeah, and it's so characters. cheap, and it really undermines a lot of the motivations. Yeah, the, the, the two decisions in this book that don't make sense that I think you could fix are Darren Strand deciding to steal the spider. Yeah. And the reason Mr. Cripsley... If Darren Strand had tricked Mr. Cripsley into agreeing it, to it, if Darren Strand had thought of something smart, mm. it would have worked better. For one, Darren Strand later 
making swindles, which he does, but it's all Mr. Crepsley's idea. Which, again, when Darren Shan's like, I hate being a vampire, it's not like, oh, I hate that this was the path I chose yeah. to set, to do something. It's like, this is all Mr. Crepsley's fault. The way to go about it would have been Crepsley tastes Steve's blood and realises that he's evil, rejects Steve, mm. Steve attacks him immediately, justifying that he's evil. Yeah. Um, or in some way, being ultra-violent or something, like, or having bought weapons already with him. Yeah. Crepsley nearly kills Steve or kidnaps him, then Darren either has to save him immediately or go and get him back, at which point Crepsley is like, all right then. Well, I need a kid. I need, yeah, uh, I need an assistant because I need to get back to the Cirque du Freak. Uh, I like, get rid of the whole telepathic thing with Mr. Tall, unless that is super necessary. But <laughs> have Mr. Crepsley, yeah, and get rid of the whole vampire generals looking down on kids being turned and just say, yeah, all right, I need an assistant. Yeah, you just, do that for me. It doesn't have to be they, your friend they look down upon kids being turned. Maybe they just look down on people turning people that haven't been brought yeah. to meet the vampire generals. And that's what they don't like. It's not to do with children or adults. It's no. like, no, we need to vet them first. You could circumvent that whole decision in the book yeah. <laughs> uh, with just some more competent storytelling again it's not I don't think that Darren Chan is a bad storyteller I think he's just a bit lazy yeah, I think this is a great story like it's, it's compelling it's compelling as fuck it is compelling if you it, it's a crumbly it's a little bit crumbly it's a little bit brittle of a story it you is. can really snap it apart if you try yeah. Darren Chan set, set face on death well, I, Steve I'd like the death sequence though of, like uh, them breaking his neck and yeah, giving him the, out a window. giving the potion and stuff and burying him and him being in the coffin. Oh, that was cool. Yeah. It's a nice sequence. It's a part of the book that I found really interesting. Darren has to reflect on things while he's like yeah, buried like alive. Yeah. Um, that would be a pretty haunting thing to happen to you. Yeah, like Steve breaks in and has a look at him. While and he's paralyzed. also while he's under the influence of the potion, he his dad comes in in the night. And cries over his dead body, yeah, and he's a horrible. But Darren's also like, "Oh, I never thought I'd see my dad cry." Even under the circumstances, Darren's surprised that his dad is crying, <laughs> which is a bit of an outdated book in terms of gender roles. And I hate myself for saying it. <laughs> really didn't want to say it that way, but he he references the fact that his mum has a stamp collection earlier on in the book, yeah. and he's like, "I used to do that back when I was a kid, and I like trivial bullshit." Basically, my mum's a fucking idiot and she still likes things that could amuse a child. Oh, my dad's crying. you never see my dad cry because he's a man. Because right. he's a bloke. And I was like, oh, come on, man. And I'm sick of football. Just I'm, sick of football. I'm also sick of football. And there's a lot of things like that. Also, Annie being the whole reason that... Annie is... We haven't mentioned... We haven't, really, I haven't really mentioned, mentioned Annie. 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 Annie is Darren Shan's little... Sister. Sister. Yeah. And while he's playing with Adam Octa, she bursts in, which is why Steve gets bitten. Yeah. She's the, the catalyst for the swap. Yeah. Well, there's just no strong female characters. Annie and Debbie are stronger than Steve and Darren's mum, at least. Trosca's a non-entity because she can't speak English, so the only dynamic they have is that she makes him... She's a she gives seamstress. him a, a haircut and makes him clothes, which is a nice gesture. But yeah, again... But another stereotypical female. Yeah. 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 Um, and then Debbie is like more experienced. She ends up being his girlfriend in book three. She's like a more experienced. She kind of seems like she's kissed boys before and she goads him into doing it. Yeah. And she's fun. But ultimately he uses her as bait um, <laughs> to catch a vampanese that if it went tits up, he wouldn't be that. Everyone would just be dead. <laughs> but he wouldn't be that caught up. Like he wouldn't be that choked up about Debbie dying. But he was like, that's what I'm prepared to use as bait. Annie is the strongest female character in the book. And this is justified by Darren saying, for a little sister, she's not a piece of shit. <laughs> um, she's fine sometimes. Yeah. She's tolerable. Yeah. It's just the whole, the whole relationship with women throughout the books so far has not been... Um, not been great. Not been it's too... Very more than two, it's very two-dimensional yeah. and that's generous. It's one-dimensional, Darren. <laughs> um, so they do the death sequence... Darren asked Miss Crepsy a bunch of questions about vampires, um, and I have a, I have a lot of things for it because they spend a lot of time in the books. The adults make fun of Darren Shan, yeah, uh, for not knowing something. And here I've written down: Mister Crepsy makes fun of Darren for suggesting he could turn into a bat, but he owns a magical <laughs> telepathic spider, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is one of those classic things where it's like. The book says a lot, like, oh, vampires aren't like how they are in the movies. Yeah. You have things like magical telepathic spiders. You know, they don't bite their victims. They have super strong nails. I'm like, this is just as ridiculous. Yeah. I um, I do enjoy the lore a lot in this. I mm. feel like, I like it was a it. good move to make your own 
Yeah, panels I like it. I like learning about it. What I, what I disdain is constantly being told, well, it's not like it is in the movies, yeah. when you have just an equally arbitrary and ridiculous mythology behind your vampires. Yeah. Like, oh, you can always tell a vampire because they have the ten scars on their fingers from when they do the blood transfusion. Apart from, sometimes you don't do that. Do they so, not do that? Is, that? is there a way that they don't turn people? Cut any part of your body and do it, right? Isn't yeah. It? But that's their sort of ritualistic way of that's doing it. That's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. But yeah, you wouldn't need to do it. I never thought about it. You wouldn't need to do that. Give yeah. away the fact that you're a vampire. Yeah. And having the scars on your fingers. I think it becomes pretty obvious that you're a vampire because you get like really cocky. You get blue skin and uh, <laughs> scars. Yeah, like the cover of this book, good, good, good callback. Everything's written in the terms and the constructs of a child they can understand. So instead of having like ways of describing things as grand or impressive everything is cool yeah like the darren considers something to be cool as a reader as a 14 year old reader and if you like darren shan as a character because darren shan is every 14 year old boy ever yeah you can very easily look at that and say oh he thinks it's cool it's probably cool yeah the other thing is um when mr crepsley flits him to the hospital flitting is when a vampire can move thousands of miles a second it's like the bfg you know when the bfg just speeds up <laughs> and he can cross land really fast, but he's moving at the same. He's physically yeah, looks yeah, like he's yeah. moving at the same speed. Yeah, he just jacked that from the BFG. Yeah, 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 yeah. But um, to describe how long it should have taken them, rather than the ten seconds it did, um, Darren describes. Darren is like, oh, the the hospital would have taken ten minutes of sprinting to get to, which is like a distance a kid could really understand. Like, yeah. It, you can understand that as a fourteen-year-old boy. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a long way. Don't put in miles or kilometers. Just like yeah, ten minutes. He ran a ten. Minute. Yeah, fuck me. <laughs> uh, which I actually really like about the book. When um, they meet Sam in book two, he says, "I've made a second friend." Cool, I thought. You're like, <laughs> God, you big that up. You big that moment up, Darren. You really uh, deflated it. It's it's that phrase, that word, cool, comes yeah. up so much. I was I was going to get the PDFs really and do a word it. count on call, but I forgot. Ah, oh, that would be a good thing to do. Yeah, it really dates it. Even though call, I'm going to still... just bring them up in the video here. This, this is a uh, uh, book one, <laughs> book two, book three. Uh, cool counts. Oh, cool count. Cool count. That's Which cool is what count. Martin Crepley is. He's a cool count. He is a cool. He's not that cool. He's kind of a loser. Yeah, but my wordplay necessitated that he was cool. For yeah, the joke that's right. What I'd like to talk about is the final part. The final part of this puzzle. It's Darren Strand said that he's hidden the country. And that he doesn't want you to know what the country is because he wants to protect everyone as much as possible. Yeah, so let's work out what country it is. I've got some facts. They use dollars. They use dollars. That's fact one I've written. Narrows it down a bit. Uh, number two is all adults know immediately that freak shows are illegal and say they're illegal when asked about freak shows, which I think is a weird affectation. Like if your kid came up to you and said, What's a freak show? What would be your first? I'd be like, oh, it's like an old uh, traveling yeah, sideshow. Like, they're illegal they... now. Yeah. Oh, you don't want to go to them. <laughs> like, oh, all right. <laughs> Defensive. Um, they call football soccer. Yep. We've called it football here, but they call it soccer. So they have foxes, which I was like, oh, that must mean it's in Europe, because I'm sure there's no North American foxes, but there are. But I also think there's hedgehogs, and there's not North American hedgehogs, mm. which would place it in Europe. Free healthcare. Free healthcare. Bye-bye, United States. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, their names are Steve. Yeah. Uh, the, <laughs> Alan. The, my, my, the, when, when, he, uh, when they have dinner at the end of book one, yeah. they have... If it's not having chips, they have french fries. Do they? They have yeah. a meatloaf as well, right? Debbie's parents cook them a meatloaf. Very American thing. Soak de freak. French. French. Do you know where I'm thinking? Uh, Canada. Canada. Oh, Canada. I think these books are set in Canada. That is my. That well, is right. the only one I can resolve to. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Resolve to. Nice. I like that because I was really um, causing me anxiety, not knowing where it was set this whole time. <laughs> but I don't let it be set in nowhere. Man. Because when I read this when I was a kid, I don't know if you did this, but I, my imagination was good, but if I had to imagine something in a setting, it was always places I knew. Mm. So when Darren was playing football at school, it was my primary school. Yeah. Um, I did that now. I did that today. Like when I read these, I thought of my, my secondary school when he was playing football and when he was in the toilets. I did that, but only because I'm remembering thinking that when no, I read I it the first time. No, I did it completely time. new. <laughs> in the, fresh. the original settings, for places I wouldn't have been to, so like the city or the, a field somewhere, like that that was all fresh for me now, and I could imagine a new yeah. environment, but schools and shit. The, there's some references in the book that are weird, which speaks to the fact that 
Darren Shan is the author analogue and not the audience analogue because yeah. the audience analogue is a 14 year old boy yeah. but he references the creature from the Black Lagoon in of it of course a yes. horror film from the 50s I think yeah 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 that's and odd. also Spawn like a uh, yeah, uh, yeah, an like eight... things Darren Shan the author would like yeah, yeah yeah exactly that he would like and so I thought that was weird like are you trying to get me into things that you're like like oh if you like the kind of content that I'm creating maybe you should, you should check out Spawn the creature from the or the creature from the Black Lagoon I would not have liked if I watched when I was a 14 year old no now I think it's really fucking eerie and creepy yeah. but as a 14 year old boy definitely not boring yeah so I thought that was a bit not weird it's just testament to Darren Shan putting himself in the book yeah. What do I think is cool? I don't have to think about it any more than that. Um, <laughs> and it also, the book kind of gets stuck between him trying to pander to the audience, like, oh, school is shit, school's not cool. Mm-hmm. But I kind of like it when my teachers do this. Like, if you feel this way about school, like, you can. it's actually a good thing. And I'm yeah. reinforcing that the fact that the education system is positive. Yeah, like, he doesn't just want to shit on school. Yeah. Well, he doesn't want to be, be put in the band book club. True, and I also the same thing later on with gore and you know, stuff. I would really say that this is our generation's Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> I fucking hate Catcher in the Rye. It's a piece of shit. Um, I've never read it. No, it's, yeah, that was just a throwaway I mean, joke for you. We're that, gonna move on. From no, Catcher I want to analyze that. <laughs> I'm gonna spend a long time on it. They we both do have, have two more books. They both have about. mopey fucking teenagers as the central characters, but Darren is eminently more likable. Yeah, well, he's just sort of normal. And he really gets over being broken away from his... Yeah, That's what I want to talk about. But he really gets over being having his whole family wrapped away from him quite well, quite fast. He does. Um, like, um, I guess because Darren... I guess Darren Chan, the author, doesn't want to write, like, oh, I cried every night for a yeah. month at the heartbreak of losing my... Like, I walked around like a husk because no. of how disparate I felt from you don't get bogged ripped down apart from my family. That is an interesting point. It is the kind of quintessential coming-of-age story under the, within the framework of vampirism yeah rejecting your family going out into the world on your own with a new male father figure to teach you yeah, whatever. Like Mountain. not the reference i would have picked <laughs> <laughs> this is the end of the video uh, we didn't record an outro so this is it here we're going to be doing more books in this series and on the end here i've put a little bit of extra content that i didn't know where to fit in the early bit, so have fun. Another thing that speaks to the point of Darren Chan's egomania is that he couldn't possibly have have, have had himself make a mistake to put Steve in jeopardy. He had to have Annie <laughs> burst in and take sort of most of the responsibility for yeah, starting yeah, we'll the whole get, we'll thing. We'll get to uh, the horrible mistake. Yeah. And you can explain to me why that's narcissistic. I just did. <laughs> in great detail. <laughs> um... But, uh, so Steve, I've, I've got a note here. Steve is the kid that needs saving. Steve's the one that needs, like, a new father figure and a new perspective on life. Yeah. Not Darren Shan. Darren Shan has, like, a lovely home life. Like, is having a great time. Really good at school. Sick at football. Just so good at football. He's having a nice time. Steve, like, depressed. Needs therapy. Mm. Anger issues. The works. The best thing he's got going for him is that he's Darren's mate. Yeah, yeah. Darren puts up with him his best thing. So, what do you think these books would be like if Steve was the main character? Um, they'd have an arc. Yeah, because Darren doesn't have anywhere to go. No, he's just sort of gloomy, which you can't really be mad about because he's fourteen and his whole life's been ruined. Yeah. Because that's the thing. If it was Steve, you wouldn't have the dynamic of him regretting going with Mr. Crepsley, which in a way makes sense that then the protagonist is Darren and he has a good life. Yeah. So Steve's, oh fuck my mum. I give a shit about leaving my bullshit school behind. <laughs> this is fine. So you lose all of that conflict from the early part of the book. Mm. So then you have to go straight to the Vampanese race war, which I wouldn't hate. <laughs> I feel like it needs to ramp up to the Vampanese race war. It does. But then you have the trials and the vampire generals and stuff. Yeah, I really want to read. I, I want to do something else for a bit that's not read Darren Shan books. However, I would like to get to the, the trials. I'm really enjoying reading them. All right. Well, uh, no, this is that's not for me to pressure you into into doing it fast, but like I find the pace of them very they're, good. They're, they're a really good nugget. I really enjoy. I think they're a great page turner. Yeah, like you want to just finish it. How many flaws I think that book, those books have, and I'm like, I was like interested to start the next one. I want, I had momentum coming out of the second one into the third one. Yeah, def- definitely. There's a lot of the se- the finale of the second one. I think is a massive peak of the series. Yeah, um, it leaves you right on the. 
the resolution of Sam being drunk from. Drank yeah. from. <clears throat> but regardless of that. I'm going to deviate constantly, by the way. So. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Um, so, I've got my notes in the wrong order. 